Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Cindy, and I'm an alcoholic. And because of the grace of God and some simple actions in this program, both sides of sponsorship, I've been sober since December the 17th, 1985, and for that I'm very grateful. And uh, while I don't necessarily say that to brag, it gives me bragging rights. I've been sober longer than I drank. It's the biggest deal in my life. Bar none, the fact that I don't have to drink today is the biggest deal in my life. I need never forget that. Um, the reason I get to stay sober has as much to do with the grace of God as anything else. Because, see, I haven't done this thing perfectly. I've done what it talks about in the forewords. I, I got here and I've really tried. And because I've really tried and, uh, and I've stayed in the center of Alcoholics Anonymous, when I've made mistakes... I've been able to learn from them instead of drink at them. I've been able to uh, walk through feeling ashamed of myself and of my behavior and not being happy with who I am, and I've been able to do it right here and not drink at it. And because I've been able to do that, guess what? I didn't have to repeat the same mistake again. Because, see, when I drank, here's what it looked like. I, I would drink, and I would create problems, and... uh and I'd wake up from those problems, and I would have to drink some more to try to deal with those problems. And I'd create more problems. And in sobriety, as long as I'm in the center of Alcoholics Anonymous, even if I create problems, I get to learn from them and not keep creating the same problems. And that's that's the grace of God. You know, I, I don't have to get here and get good. I don't have to get here and get perfect. I just get to just be me and really try. Um, I've been willing to take some direction from a sponsor, and I've been willing to... Uh, work the steps and sponsor women and I used to go to four meetings a week no matter what um, I am still a student I did not become the teacher and just because I'm here does not make me the teacher I am a student of Alcoholics Anonymous I'm a student of recovery I'm a student of spirituality and how do I implement that in my life thank you God now when I got here I couldn't stand that word God oh, it was worse than a four letter word to me four letter word composed most of my vocabulary you know, on the way here, uh, I read a book, and uh, and that's a real miracle that I was able to read the book, and you'll hear about that a little later. And I read it in, on my way to New Orleans and back, and I forgot it, so I read it again on the way here. <laughs> and, and and this time I remembered it, and uh, and it, and, it, and and this guy named Ellie something or other wrote it, and uh, and and he was in uh, Auschwitz, I think is how you pronounce that, and. Uh, all those camps and stuff. He won the Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, and and so any time that I start to feel sorry for myself, I there's other people. Everybody, there's always somebody that's got things worse. And but when I read this book, uh, what happened was I started to cry. And I'm on this plane and I'm crying. And uh, when I got here, I had no compassion. I couldn't love. I couldn't feel or experience your pain. You didn't matter to me. Nothing mattered to me. I was hopeless, I was dreamless, and I was broken. And I didn't have the ability to have compassion. When I first got here, I was 17 years old. It was in 1980. And uh, by the time I was 17 years old, I'd been in 25 institutions. I'd been in all these social service programs. I'd lived on the streets, and I'd been hitchhiked from one end of this country to the other, and I did everything that you do living on the streets, and I, and I, I was essentially either institutionalized or a street person, and that's, that's who I was. I drank since I was this big, and I drank for the very reason it talks about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I drank for the effect. It moved me. It let me feel different. That's the only reason I ever drank. I didn't want to be in here. I wanted to be anywhere but in here. I hurt, and I blamed you, and I blamed the world and my poor, pitiful life. Drinking was the only good thing. Drinking was the only thing that gave me any relief. So by the time I got here at 17 years old, I was hopeless. 
I, when I talk about institutions, I'm not talking about little holiday in places. Okay? I was in the state mental hospitals in the 70s. And the state mental hospitals as a young girl in the 70s was not a very pretty place to be. You know? By the time I got here, I wasn't welcome in juvenile facilities anymore. I was an animal. And, uh, and I liked to pretty it up. I liked it, but I've looked pretty. I did. I was young and cute. As long as you're young and cute, if you can get out of that institution and make it to the streets, you can drink. You can be okay. You can even ride in limousines and rose horses until you start puking in the back seat. When I first got sober at 17, my cousin died in childbirth, and she was in her 20s. And uh, I lived in a lot of foster homes and things like that, and I used to visit her when I lived in a foster home on her side of town. And... Um, and, and I guess people thought we were close. And her husband uh, came up to me at the funeral, and he was sobbing. And he came up to me, and, he, and this is what I thought about on the plane. And he came up to me like I was a person that would understand his pain. I could see in his eyes that he wanted something from me. You know, I could see that he thought that I was going to share what he felt. And I felt nothing. And I knew there was something so broken in me. I looked at her in the coffin and I felt nothing. I didn't have the ability to feel. It's not that I didn't want to. I just didn't. I wanted to that day. I wanted to cry. I wanted to understand how much he must hurt. I couldn't get it at all. And that's just to sort of let you know who I was when I got here. Um, when I originally got here, uh, it was uh, 1980, and I was barely 17 years old, and what got me here was not, uh, I think that Alcoholics Anonymous might hold some hope for me. What got me here was seven felonies. Uh, I woke up laying in University Hospital in Cincinnati, and I was on a, on a, whatever those things are, a stretcher thing, and they had me on the wall tied down. And see, I'm a big victim. You know, I'm just a big victim. That's how I saw myself, nothing but a victim. And, and people always did things to me. And so when I saw myself, I was bruised from my chin to my knees. And I, I was like, who did this to me? See, you understand, I'm barely 17 years old, all right? And I'm a blackout drinker. And when I drink, I don't remember what happens. And I wake up in very compromising positions, you know. And when I drink, that just seems to happen. And by the time that I was 17 years old, before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, that's how I drank all the time. That's disgusting. So I wake up and I told this nurse, I said, who did this to me? And she said, uh, you did. And she told me I was an alcoholic. That was a very, very sad day. She also said I had seven felonies and that the county sheriff was over and that I wasn't being taken to ju juvenile and I was being extradited over and I was going to be tried as an adult. Now, at 17 years old, if you were young, white, female, and cute in 1980, it was very unusual to extradite somebody over, and I'm not sure if they were trying to scare me straight or what. But I'll tell you what happened that night, uh, and as it was relayed to me, I have no memory of that night. So if this story, this story is just what was told to me, you know, I, uh, I carried a gun. And I carried a gun because I was afraid. You know, I, 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 there's nothing scarier than a scared drunk with a gun. <laughs> so... See, here's how it was. I didn't have a lot of social skills, as you can imagine. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have my own voice, but I really wanted to be heard. You know what I mean? And so uh, what I found was when you weren't listening well, when I brought out my gun, you paid a lot more attention. <laughs> so I was talking to this girl that didn't want to talk to me. Now, I don't know why you wouldn't want to talk to me drunk. <laughs> But she didn't want to talk to me. She was going in this retail store to get the heck away from me. And she went in that retail store, and I went in now. You know, while we judge ourselves by our intentions, the rest of the world continues to judge us by our actions. <laughs> what a bummer. Um, see, I've never, I've never had a criminal mind. No, I'm not really a criminal, you know, because I don't think like a criminal. I'm too dumb to think like a criminal. All right. But I do tend to break out in some criminal activity. But it, it's... 
And see, what happens is if you go to talk to somebody in the store with your gun just to have a conversation, <laughs> do you know that that is a very bad idea? <laughs> And do you know what the little lady behind the counter thinks you're trying to do? Even, I didn't want to take nothing, I can promise you that. Then they call the police. The popo comes. You try to explain why you got your gun. They want it. It's the only security you got. It's the only thing you own. You try to explain why you really can't give it to them. <laughs> Do you know that each one of those things is a felony? <laughs> oh, yeah. So you see what I mean? Like, all I try to do is talk to somebody and they give me seven felonies. I'm a victim. <laughs> see, that's my keen alcoholic mind. And that's what I do. And see, fortunately, I was beat up from the streets. And because I was very beat up the streets, and I was a garbage can, and I talked in the workshop this morning, and I'm not going to go through that diatribe again. But what makes me an alcoholic is that when I drink alcohol, I get the phenomenon of craving. It doesn't say every time. For me, it was by the end. But it, it says that if you ever get that. It says if you, if you, it says only we get it. It says the average temper drinker never gets a craving beyond their control. They never plan to be at that baseball game for his final grand slam and, uh, well, maybe we'll just show up afterwards and see how it turned out because we're in the middle of drinking. They never do that. They never have that kind of a craving, you know? Only we do. And that's what makes me an alcoholic. See, the consequences of my actions have not anything to do with my alcohols. And that's important for me to share, and it's important for me to know. I work in the prisons not as a job. I do service work in the prisons. I love prison work. And, uh, and there are a lot of people in prison that don't have our problem. Okay, so there are people that have consequences that don't have alcoholism. And some people that have alcoholism... Their biggest consequence is that their values shift left of center or they're not there for their children or they become somebody that they didn't want to be. They are just as alcoholic as me with my big bravado consequence. That is important for both me to know and for them to know. So let me be clear about that. The reason I'm an alcoholic is when I drink alcohol, I get the phenomenon of craving that other people don't get unless you're one of us. And um, I'm a garbage can. I'll do anything because, see, I just want to feel different. You know, so that is part of my story. You hand it to me, I'm doing it if it will make me feel different. Um, and as a result, when I was in jail, I went into a lot of withdrawal. And, uh, and they had to take me back to the hospital. And... Long story short, I got to go to treatment. I don't know how it happened. I don't know what happened. But I went to treatment in Podunk, Ohio. I got, I, I, I'm talking about farms and farmers. I'm not kidding. Cornfields. They carried me in. That's hard to imagine now. But I was malnourished. <laughs> it does not have to be that funny. I just... <laughs> really disappointing um, <laughs> so back then they put me in these whirlpool tubs and it's it was a kind of good hospital they had good food you know and uh and and see I'm 17 I'm barely 17 and the next person closest in age to me is like 35 and most of them are 16 70 they are all men they have never seen anybody quite like me I'm quite like a novelty to them um I didn't have to go to any meetings or do the program for two weeks. For two weeks, they just tried to get me back to life. And then after those two weeks, they said, Cindy Masters, it is time to go to an A of A meeting. <laughs> I said, an A of A meeting, are you out of your ever-loving mind? Now, understand, when I went there, see, I've been on the streets a long time. 
And I have one claim to fame, and that's I'm a drug addict. I'm a street warrior. I'm bad to the bone, all right? <laughs> that's all I am, all right? I got about a five-word vocabulary. Use your imagination. I'm quite sure those farmers had never heard it. And uh, <laughs> they're like, Cindy Masters, you got to go to the A of A meeting. I'm like, I'm not going to the A of A meeting. Cindy Masters, you've got to go to the A of A meeting. I am not going to the A of A meeting. I said, I'll tell you what. Bright idea. You ever get one of those? <laughs> Here's my bright idea. When I lived in Washington, D.C., in the middle of the night, many of you are too young to remember this, but they didn't have cable all the time. <laughs> and actually, after a certain hour at night, there were no more TV. <laughs> and the TV would snow. Do you know what I'm talking about? It had little white snow like this. I know that I'm going to, hopefully I'm going to live old enough that someday nobody knows what the hell I'm talking about. But, you know, it's like, it's like the TV would snow, and Narcotics Anonymous knew we were the only ones would be watching that. And, um... <laughs> And they put a little public service announcement on there and it said, if you think you might have a problem with drugs, you might want to call Narcotics Anonymous. Well, I put that in the back of my little pea brain. I said, you know what? If I ever have a problem with drugs, I might call those fellas. Well, right idea. See, being a drug addict, there's something cool about that. You know what I mean? I've never been nothing, right? But I've been a drug addict. I'm cool. I'm bad to the bone. Do not mess with this. I will go to Narcotics Anonymous. They said, Cindy, there's no Narcotics Anonymous in the greater Cincinnati area. And in 1980, there was not. And then they asked me that really, really hard question. Cindy Masters, you can go to the A of A meeting or you can go to jail. The choice is yours. <laughs> Only for us is that difficult. If somebody asked you that and you got to think about it, <laughs> stay right here no matter what. <laughs> so I went to their dumb A of A meeting. I did not find a pair of shoes that fit. These guys had no teeth. <laughs> Sort of like, you know when you're, uh, like, out there, right? And you first start out with the fellas because, you know, they'll buy your booze and stuff. And when you first start out with them, like, when I first started out with them, they were in limousines and Rolls Royces, right? And you know you've kind of hit the bottom when they don't have teeth anymore. And uh, it's like the, the progression of your alcoholism. Boom! <laughs> Guilty. Uh, and so I got these old men. And ladies, we know what old men are about when we're 17, cute and stellar, fresh off the streets. <laughs> we know, I know what old men want. <laughs> I know what old men like. <laughs> so I had a boulder right here. The Rock of Gibraltar sat upon my shoulder. And then they talked about this God stuff. Oh, I was really kind of opposed to that word. And uh, I was a jackass. There's no other way to put it. You guys have seen people like me come in. We're fresh off the street. You're trying to help me. Do you know who I am? Don't try to hug me. <laughs> Don't get near me. You can't touch this. Cindy Masters, bad to the bone. All of my life, 
all of my life, what I said is if somebody would only love me, if somebody would only care about me, my life could be different. And you all tried to love me, and I was too afraid to let you near me. And see, my five-word vocabulary was a shield. I used it like a weapon. I used it to keep you over here so you couldn't get near me. And all I wanted was for you to be near me. Please love me. Please care about me. Please give a damn. And I would push you away, and I was rough and tough and from the streets. And you know what you did? You were kind to me. You loved me. Those old farmers, their wives, they brought me cookies and candy. I think it's because they just want to hear those words come out of my mouth. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, I'd never treated anybody so poorly and have them be so nice to me in my life. Let me never forget that when I'm dealing with some punked out newcomer. Let me never forget that. Because all that is for me and all that was, was fear. I was so afraid. I was so afraid. And I was afraid to believe that what you offered might be real. See, they told me, Cindy Masters, just work those 12 steps. Your life can be different. And I said, you don't understand. I'm broken. See, I've been in state mental hospitals. I've been diagnosed with everything under the sun. You don't understand. I wish that your little 12 steps would work for me. But I'm different. I'm so broken. And I was afraid. I was afraid to believe it. I was afraid. See, if I tried it and it didn't work, then what was left for me? And I just knew I was so different. And so I would hold that off as a last resort. And I came to Alcoholics Anonymous to be loved. Because you loved me in spite of me. You were kind to me no matter what. But it won't get me sober. And... I went to the local AA clubhouse and found a couple fellas. That's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> Prince Charming's not waiting there. <laughs> and I would go to A of A meet and see, because I didn't understand that phenomenon of craving. I didn't understand the questions in the beginning and the first paragraph of We Agnostics that tell us what an alcoholic is. I didn't understand any of that. And I was sure I was a drug addict. I was sure that I was different. And I would sit in AA meetings and I would feel guilty. I would feel ashamed. I felt that I was lying to have my seat. If you lie to have your seat in an AA meeting, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Um, so I found a couple fellows, and when I drink, I get above the rules. That magnificent magnifying mind the book talks about, I got it. And, uh, and I get really good ideas, and I get a sense of entitlement. See, because I've had such a terrible life, I deserve things that people that didn't have such a terrible life have. And um, that's part of why I tend to break out in felonies. But... Um, <laughs> And guys in AA are so easy. <laughs> They're just dumb. And uh, <laughs> so I decided I should have carpeting in my home. I had hardwood floors. Now I got no taste, right? So I talked them into helping me go borrow some from a model home, some carpeting. <laughs> But see, I have to drink to get enough courage. So we're drinking, and, um, and here's my bright idea. We'll do it in broad daylight. <laughs> we'll look like we belong there. We'll draw attention to ourselves by waving at the neighbors. <laughs> because nobody that was stealing would do that. What I learned is there's a reason why nobody that was stealing would do that. <laughs> See, here's the good news. I'm a drunk drunk. And when I drink, I get dumb and I get caught. I could never be a career criminal. I get too drunk. And, uh, and so I got caught. It was a county I'd not been caught in before. And anyway, I got tried as a juvenile, and that was good news for me. And then after I went through all that, um, my little juvenile PO had been a detox nurse for years before. And she knew that I loved Alcoholics Anonymous with all of my heart. 
I'm not kidding. I really did. You guys just couldn't tell. <laughs> you see, I just didn't think I deserved it. You see, I hear a lot of people come here and they think, I'm too good for this. Well, I came here and thought you were too good for me. See, I came here and I couldn't believe you would let me be with you. I couldn't believe that I could maybe be like your equal. You seemed uh, like big people to me that were having real lives. And uh, I didn't still have any hope or dreams. So she sent me to this halfway house in Lexington, Kentucky. And, uh, and I learned some things there. I learned that I was an alcoholic. I uh, learned uh, that I had to have some kind of power greater than me, but I could pick what that was. And I learned, I began to learn um, what it was like to get a sense of personal value. You see, I wanted to um, have you fix all the broken things in me so that I could go and behave properly. See, if you would fix it so that I could feel better, you know, the right therapist, the right pill, the right something, then I would be able to take the right action to have a real life like everybody else. And what I learned by living there was that by taking the right action, I began to feel right. I began to feel better. I began to, to have uh, what we like to say is self-esteem. I, I, I began to like myself and feel like I belonged in the human race. And what I mean by the right action is things like um, trying to work the steps and having a sponsor. And I got, see, I, I, when you come, I didn't go to high school. All right, it's not like I just didn't graduate from high school. I lived on the streets. And uh, they, they, it's like, you know, you just don't think about it. And uh, so I didn't go. And, uh, and it, I went a little bit when I was in some institution. They put me, like, in special ed in an institution, which is really makes this whole little label on your head go off. But So I didn't know if I was stupid. And so they said, Cindy, go take these little tests to see about taking the test for the GED. you got to take tests to see if you can take a test. And, uh, <laughs> and see, I was afraid because now you guys were going to know I'm dumb. Okay, I'm street smart, but now you're going to find out I'm stupid. And I went and took their little test because that's what they said to do. And I learned to just do what you said to do. And you know what happened? I took those little tests. They said I didn't have to take the dumb little classes. I just could take the big test. And I took the big test, and I did really good on the big test. And you know what happened? I started to feel better about myself. And I got a little job. And I started putting my own money in my pocket instead of trying to manipulate somebody sexually or otherwise so that I could have enough money to take care of myself. And you know what happened when I bought my own Coke and my own coffee? I started to feel better about myself. I started to feel like I deserved some of the air I breathed. See, I've never been quite enough. But I've always been more so that you could think that I was enough so I could be with you. But I've never really been enough. And uh, and I left that halfway house and I went back to Cincinnati and I was AA Wonder Girl. I went from I went from a five word vocabulary to a 20 word vocabulary. I wouldn't call me a young lady, but I was on my way. And uh, and I got a job and I went to work every day and I went to college. And uh, and, and I did good. And uh, and I went to an AA meeting every day, and I went about the business of recovery. And I, there were, you know, for being a young person that came from the dretches of hell, and people watched me get better, and they had me talking everywhere, and you know, it was like, yay, Cindy, yay, Cindy, go, Cindy, go. And I was so loved, and I was so supported, and people were so proud of me. And see, when people would talk behind these microphones, here's what I would hear. This is not what they say, but what I would hear is. If you get sober and you're really sober and you really do this deal, you get a better job, you get more money, you get a house, you get a family, perhaps a relationship with your children, okay? I've never read any of that in the big book. And I thought for me to be a person that had real recovery, I needed a better job, I needed more money, I needed better clothes, I needed to have the right relationship, and I needed to have all of these right things so I could be enough. And really, I probably needed a better house and a better car because i got to be more to be enough, all right? So in the meantime, I'm bound here, and you guys are telling me how great I am. I love that. And, uh, 
it, but but see, I got these little things in my head that are telling me how not true that is, and what a lying piece of crap I am, and how it's not real. And when they really find out who I am, you know, then they're gonna all say, "Go away, Cindy," and that even in AA, I'm not good enough. And and and, and see, and it's like, and I'm doing my best, but but see, I got things that are unresolved. And one of the foster homes I lived in, my foster brother and sister had muscular dystrophy, and, and I got involved with MDA, and it was one of the best gifts of my life. And my 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 foster brother, um, and, well, long story short, I did this fundraiser, and 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 I made some money, and then I tried to invest that money, and the only thing that I knew how, and my motives are right. See, it's back to well, I judge myself by my intentions. The rest of the world, judge. and you know what happened to that money? I I did all that money, and so I never gave it to them, and I lied to them, and I said that the fundraiser did not make any money. And so uh, I went back to them because, see, here's what's happening. Every time that something good goes off and somebody says something good about me in the back of my head, it's like, you know that's not true. You know you even steal from handicapped children. You're a piece of crap. You suck. You know, I don't have just a committee. I've got a firing squad. <laughs> and, see, there's only two things that will shut this crap up. I can take a cocktail drink or I can go set it right. See, I'm afraid to set it right because I did illegal things. I stole money, you know. But I went to the Muscular Dystrophy Association because, quite frankly, uh, going to jail and being at peace was better than hearing that anymore. And so I went and I went to that director and I said, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I'm going to pay this back. What else can I do to make this right? And you know what she said? She said, won't you do a fundraiser for us? <laughs> Which is evidence that lots of people go to the same source expecting different results. But, <laughs> I did a fundraiser for the Muscular Dystrophy Association that was successful, and by a weird fluke of events, they had, I was 20 years old, I was almost two years sober, and uh, they had a position open for the outlying counties. There was the executive director for downtown, and then there was the executive director for the outlying counties. And uh, they offered me that position. And uh, I said, I, I've finally been recognized. <laughs> Someone has finally recognized my true potential. Hell yes. <laughs> and so I became Cynthia R. Masters District Director, Muscular Dystrophy Association. <laughs> Oh, yes. I had no idea how to dress. I'm from the streets. I bought a fuchsia suit with something like a bright purple top underneath. I had a purse and shoes that matched. Can't you see it? Across the room. There she is. <laughs> and the regional manager actually at one time did say I might perhaps be dressing a little fashionable. <laughs> Isn't that tactful? <laughs> I got a new car. I got business cards. I got a house. You know, I got all this stuff. And I went to AA meetings. And I passed out my business card. And I said, you two work the steps and you can have a person choose that match. You can have a business card that says Cynthia R. Masters, District Director, Muscular Dystrophy Association. <laughs> Can't you see it now? Now... Understand, I'm in a job I got no business whatsoever being in, okay? They, uh, I got to put on the Jerry Lewis Labor Day telethon. I got to put on a satellite locally. I don't have any idea how to do that. I don't even know how to use a secretary, and they gave me one. And, um, you know, thank God I got good volunteers. But understand, I still got this in the back of my head. You know, you just had seven felonies three years ago. If they find that out, you're toast. <laughs> you have faked your way into this. <laughs> Do you think you're crazy? You know, and, but I'm going to AA meetings and telling you how great I am. I'm telling you what the 12 steps have done for me. I'm telling you that you too can have a purse and shoes that match and a car and a house. <laughs> now, I'd never flown in my life at that point. I hitchhiked a lot. That was my best mode of transportation. And they fly me to Las Vegas to meet Jerry Lewis and the research people and all this stuff and to learn how to put on the telethon satellite in Cincinnati, Ohio. And, uh, I mean, I never even flown. You guys can just imagine it. You know, I mean, you could smoke on planes back then. <laughs> Thank God. So, uh, 
So I get off the plane and I'm in the elevator and one of those research doctors is in the elevator with me. And when I was young, I was kind of cute. And uh, he hit on me. Inappropriately, he hit on me. And this will tell you where my self-esteem was. I didn't tell him to go take a flying hike. I did like this. I felt so ashamed of myself that I felt unworthy for somebody in his position to hit on me. And so I cowered in shame because I'm not good enough to be with those people. I'm not good enough to even be treated inappropriately sexually. What am I doing being the director of the Muscular Dystrophy Association? That gives you a window in. But see, I'm living a double life. When I'm coming to meetings, I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you, a doctor hit on me. They all want me. Okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because i got to be more to be enough. Because i got to be more for you to like me. i got to have more to spit with you, you know? Because I don't deserve the very air I breathe. Do you guys need, do I even need to explain what happened? Of course I picked up a cocktail. But that's not what it looked like. See, I don't know about you, but relapse doesn't, see, and I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous breathed life into me. Nothing in my whole life breathed life on me till I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. So for me, it doesn't look like Cindy Masters. I believe perhaps you might be getting ready to have a relapse. Maybe you need to look at living a double life sober. <laughs> Hell no. Here's what my brain says. You sexy, hot thing, they all want you. <laughs> so I start sleeping with all of you. <laughs> I go to a meeting and anybody that wants to go home with me can and I start treating myself exactly the way I treated myself when I lived on the streets. And I start hating myself exactly the same way I did walking in the door. See, I can't live like I live drinking and expect to stay sober. I don't remember taking a drink. I remember waking up drunk. There are bottles around me. Probably him, you know, or her. <laughs> who knows? Who cares? And... uh because when you're self-destructing, it doesn't matter. It ain't about anybody. It's about self-destructing. And um, and I thought that I would do, I thought one thing, I thought I was glad I didn't have to go back to that job. See, I didn't feel like I had a way out. I didn't feel like I could say I can't handle it. I had too much pride to say that. But I was glad I didn't have to go back to that job. And then I thought, well, I'll just go back to Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I love AA. What I didn't count on was the phenomenon of craving kicking in. You see... I have a gift of recovery that I'm not guaranteed again. And uh, I get a choice. I have the power of choice and drink today. When I woke up today, God, please help me stay sober. And thank you so much. I thank him in advance, you know. And, uh, and, and today I get to be sober. But it's because the phenomenon of craving hasn't kicked in. And I haven't lost that power to ask God to help me today and to take the right action to stay sober today. You see, I would go to an AA meeting and I'd be like, today's the day. I'm going to get sober. I'm going to get sober. I want to come back. I want to come back. And you know what happened? I would leave that meeting and I would have to drink. I didn't want to drink. I had to drink. I lost the power of choice. This went on for almost a full year. And it was a very sad and hard year. And what happened was the longer that year went on, the more my drinking life became a normal one. There were no great big deals that happened, just pitiful and comprehensible demoralization. When I drink, I throw up. When I drink, I black out. That's who I am. You know, and by the end of the year, you know, people that I'm with, they're losing jobs like me. We're all like whoever got kicked out of their apartment moves in with whoever didn't get kicked out of their apartment. And that's how my life went. It was just sort of disgusting, you know, and it just felt sort of normal. And my last drunk was December the 16th, 1985. And what happened was I sat in front of my house crying because I couldn't find my home. I woke up out of a blackout. Now, understand, in Cincinnati, Ohio, December's kind of cold, you know. And so when you wake up in front of your own house, but you don't know you're in front of your house. And if you're a blackout drinker like me, it's very frightening to come out of a blackout. You don't know where you are. You don't know who you're with. You don't know if you're ever going to be able to get home. You don't know if you're in the right state. You don't know what's happened to you. And, you know, you have to evaluate really quick. Well, I'm there and I'm scared. I'm terrified. And I can't find my home and I'm looking at my house. 
That's pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. In my mind, it does not get worse than that. It does not get worse than that. That's a soulless place to be. The next morning, I was told about the night before, because, you know, I'm a blackout drinker. And um, I got the gift of clarity again. And what happened was in that moment, I could see that that's as good as it's ever going to get for me. It's never going to get any better than that. The best I can hope for is to sit in front of my house afraid I can't find my home. That's disgusting. That's gross. And because of that moment, what happened was I was able to say, God, please help me. Or whatever's out there, please help me. I really doubt I use the word God. Because I can't get myself sober. I can't decide to get sober. Something's got to help me get sober. I'm just not big enough. And I came back to AA and I came back different. What do I mean by coming back different? I came back with a level of humility. What does humility mean to me? I was teachable. You see, not only was I not stupid, I was incredibly smart. I had almost a photographic memory. I read the big book and memorized it. And I was one of those little punked out kids in the meetings that I'd wait for the old timer to quote it wrong. And now to use it like a weapon. Boom, boom, boom. Paragraph four. Page 36. Does not say that. You are wrong in your facts. Oh, yeah. The first thing my sponsor said is, Cindy, you are no longer allowed to quote the big book. She said, you may only paraphrase as it applies in your life. Oh, I was quiet a long time. (laughs) I didn't even know what that meant. (laughs) See, so I had a head full of AA, but I didn't know how to be sober, and I didn't know how to have any peace, and I didn't know how to have any relief. And my sponsor made me look. She made me write out the powerlessness. She made me write out the unmanageability. And then she made me do something that isn't in the big book. She said, I want you to look at the probable consequences if you drink again. And that was easy, right? I'll go to jail, a mental hospital, or I'll die. Well, you know what my sponsor did? She laughed at me. She said, you're not afraid of any of that. And the truth is, I'm not. See, I live real good in jail. I understand the hierarchy. I'm practically the president there. (laughs) And the mental hospital, I am the queen. And... I'm not kidding. I get more pudding than anybody. And um, and, and that's all you got to do to win. That's all it takes. Thank God that I have a sponsor that makes me dig. See, that's like the next adventure. She said, um, she made me really look. And you know what? Here's what I discovered. When I drink, I'm a black hole. I suck the life out of anything that gets near me. I'm so self-centered, and I lie to myself about that self-centeredness. See, I categorize you. You might be a baker, and perhaps if I'm hungry, I can get donuts from you. And you're a decent cook, and if I need dinner, I can go there. And you're a mechanic, and by God, if my car breaks down, there'll be you. And you own apartment buildings, and someday I might need one, and I call you my friends. (laughs) See, I'm incapable of a true human relationship. And so... And so I become this big black hole that no, I can't love when I drink. Some of you might be able to, I cannot. And so, and so I, 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 I think I love you and I want to love you and I want to believe it with all my heart. But the truth is, it's all about me and my next cocktail. And I'm going to love you until you interfere with that. I'm going to love you until you get in the way of that. And, and then my love's out the window. Because I love one thing when I'm drinking. I love booze. Okay, and it becomes more important than anything. And what I realized is that the best that I was sitting in front of my house, not able to find my home, that was the best it was ever going to get to be. That's the best I could hope for. And the worst thing that happens is not that I die from drinking. The worst thing that happens is I live for maybe 20 years. And that selfish, self-centered mire of a hole of alcoholism, lying to myself the whole time, telling myself my life is a normal one, sucking the life out of everybody that gets near me, everybody that tries to love me, and everybody that tries to care about me, and that's the legacy I leave? It's still what motivates me to stay sober. If you came here to avoid dying, I hate to be the one to break the news to you. (laughs) We are all gonna. For me, how am I going to live between here and there? 
How am I going to live between here and there? I had to come to terms with this God thing. Because it couldn't just be some abstract thing anymore. I had to have something when I was afraid and I wanted to drink, and drinking seemed like the only solution. I had something that I could reach out to. And I did, and I did the third step with my sponsor out of the book, and thank, thank God I was able to do that. And I went on and I've worked the steps, and I worked them someone else's way, even when I thought that I knew better. Even when I knew it wasn't in, in the literature, when she said to look at the consequences, I did it. And you know what happened? I got to stay sober because I was willing to do something somebody else's way. I did something that I was told to do, and I've sponsored women. And I'm going to tell you about sobriety. Oh, my God. It's been really good. And it's been really bad. I have been in relationships, and I have lost relationships. I've had jobs, and I have lost jobs. I have owned businesses, and I have lost businesses. I've had success, and I have had failure. People have been born, and people have died. And guess what? I haven't drank. And because I haven't drank, I've got the wisdom of those experiences. They get to carry me. How lucky am I? How lucky am I? See, this does not turn out to be walls to walls, peaches and cream. But it is. But it isn't. It's life. But because we get to look at it different, it gets to be different. Now, I'm going to tell five quick stories, and I promise I'll shut up, because I know for you new people, this has got to be just hell, you know? <laughs> but bear with me. My sobriety is more interesting than my drinking. <laughs> I promise you. And more adventurous. My grandmother died in 1997 in July, and it completely broke my heart. And I'll tell you why it broke my heart. See, I didn't grow up in a place where I did a lot of intimacy into me, you see. I didn't do that. I, I, didn't, I didn't let people in, and there weren't a lot of kind people, and there weren't very many consistent people. But my grandmother, I would visit her when I got sober in my 20s, and before I would go to bed, see, I'm a tough broad. I'm from the streets, right? She'd wash my face. <laughs> she put a little lotion on it, and then I would go to bed. And sometimes I would sleep with her. She loved me, and I let her. And part of the reason why she loved me was because I did let her, because she could. And uh, and she was, she she's who I define spirituality by. You see, a lot of people in AA say, fear is the opposite of faith. Well, I was real afraid when I came up here, but I had an awful lot of faith. That's how I got up here. <laughs> so I find that they live together. Okay? And that what it really is, is, there, is, that, is, is that it's which one do I feed? And you see... If I feed fear, I become negative and cynical and pessimistic, and I see what's wrong in life. And when I feed faith, I see what's right in you and me. My grandmother is the only person that I've ever known that went to church on a regular basis that wasn't mean about it. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. She never, like, judged anybody. My grandmother grew up in an era where it was like a sport to pick on people for what color they were born and those kind of things. You know what? My grandmother never said a negative word about one group of people ever. Now, in her era, that's unheard of. She epitomizes spirituality to me. She fed the right dog. You know? She, she fed the right dog. And so as a result, she's loving and she was kind and she believed in God in a very, very good way that was palatable for me. And she example for me, if I could ever be half of what my grandmother was, oh, oh, that would be my heart. Here's the problem. She was 80-something, and you die when you're 80-something sometimes. And uh, so it shouldn't have been that unexpected, although it did break my heart just the fact she was dying. But what broke my heart for real is that when my grandmother went to die, she was terrified. And I got pissed. And I said, God, how can you do this? How can you take this perfect little lady that spent her whole life serving you, being a great example of you, and how can you let it finally be her time to go to the other side and let her be afraid? I don't trust you. You're not who I thought you were. And I took a walk in the dark at 11 years sober. I went to meetings, and I told the truth, which is hard because we get an AA image. I don't know about you. I get an idea. I'm 11 years sober. I should look like this. <laughs> who cares what the hell I feel like <laughs> I need to look like this 
But I took that leap of faith, and I came to meetings, and I told the truth. And I said, and see, I'm a hard ass, right? But I would cry, because if you felt God, if you've had a spiritual experience, for me, there's never been anything lonelier than not being able to connect. And I would come, and I would say, I'm so lonely, I can't feel God. And the only thing that I did right during that period of time was I kept looking for God. Now, I thought about killing myself. I share that just because a lot of us do. And the truth is, if I don't have a connection with God, life's not worth living. There's no purpose in it for me. What, I'm going to get some more stuff? Maybe I'll get a nicer outfit someday? No. It is my ability to connect with you, which happens as a result of my connection with God, that makes this life worthwhile. And so when that doesn't happen... I'm lonely. This went on from July 1997. I turned 12 years sober in December. And in in February uh, uh, 1st of 1998 is kind of where it all came to an abrupt halt. Now, in early recovery, I could not meditate. Mm, You know, I I just... Because I vibrated, man, you know? And this stuff went like this. You know, I'll never forget that first hour after my first fist step. I thought that was being still. You know what I mean? Um, so, my first meditation tool was a big old Harley Davidson. It was a 1979 shovel head. For those of you that know about bikes, you'll know I restored it. I had long fishtail straight pipes, and that thing was loud, and it vibrated like crazy. And it was so loud, it shut my head up, and I'd get out on the highway... And I would feel God in the wind. (laughs) Because you know why? God's never late. He's always on time. And I don't have to be anywhere but where I am for Him to meet me. I don't have to be able to do this. I don't have to be ready to walk into church. I don't have to be ready for anything. I can be on a damn Harley Davidson vibrating like crazy to shut my head up. And God will meet me. All i got to do is want it to happen. And that was my first meditation tool. (laughs) So, February 1, 1998, I've been at a meeting that Friday night. It's a Sunday. Boo-hoo, I can't feel God. It's been going on a long time. People are kind of over it. You know what I mean? (laughs) Oh, here comes Cindy again, godless. I got a Harley. (laughs) So I say to myself, well, it's an unusually warm day because Louisville can get, it's not like Florida, you can't just ride in February. But it was unusually warm and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go see if I can't connect. And I got on my bike and I got up on Interstate 65, which is a very busy interstate. It's like 75 over on the Gulf side here. It's it's a busy interstate. And I, I got on it. And I'm on it maybe 10 minutes. And uh, and somebody's coming over in my lane. And that happens a lot when you ride. because uh, And you got to ride out of it. I've been riding all my life. You ride out of those things. But the emergency lane was blocked. And I could not ride out of that accident. And whoever hit me, I don't know who it was because they took off. But according to the police report, they hit me and I was popped because 70 miles an hour and 65 miles an hour, somewhere like we were both doing something like that. I was popped 17 foot in the air and went straight up. I came down. There's a car driving down the highway. Imagine this. <laughs> I landed on the hood of that car. I rolled off of that car, and that car drove up me. Now, I don't know I've been drove over. I'm laying in the center lane of I-65. This side's out of my head. I don't know that either. My face was shredded by the car. And uh, my lungs were collapsed, and you can still feel the tire tract in my chest, which I think is very cool. And, uh, <laughs> and, and my heart got shifted to the left, and, uh, and, and uh, I'm laying there, and I see traffic coming out this side. I thought I'm going to get drove over. I didn't know I already been drove over. <laughs> and then I realized all I'm breathing is blood, because blood's out of every orifice of my being. And I thought, I'm dying. And I was. Uh, I actually ended up being, um, they said I died. And, uh, and, um, you know what? I got really afraid. Probably like my grandma did. You know, we're afraid to move across town. 
who am I to think we're not going to be afraid when it's time to go on that next big adventure? And so I got really afraid because I knew I was dying. And the next thing I did was I let go. I let go in such an absolute way. Um, and more absolute than I've ever let go in my life. And for anybody that has had the experience of dying, I think you'll know what I'm talking about. And once I let go, some people get a white tunnel. That's not what happened for me. But the panic went away. And I got wrapped in white billowy clouds of love. And uh, I would do the whole thing with all the losses I've had to have it again. I feel like I was cradled in God's arms. And that... Uh, that, uh, that I've known God so up close and personal, how lucky am I? I am absolutely convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is love. And that all I wanted my whole life was to be loved, and here I was cradled in God's loving arms. What a gift to me. I lived. <laughs> figured that out on your own, didn't you? (laughs) AA showed up for me. See, I had a traumatic brain injury and a spinal cord injury. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of problems. Nobody expected me to be functional again. And my friends helped me get out of the hospital. I've been so institutionalized when I was a kid that being in the institution uh, triggered stuff in me and scared me. And so they helped me come home. And they took care of me. And you guys in AA cleaned me, washed me, took me. I was in every clinic. I was in every clinic. I was in neurosurgery. I was in neurology. I was in plastic surgery. They had to rebuild my face. And um, I lost everything that, as a woman, I thought gave me value. See, I'd always been reasonably attractive. My face was shredded. I look like this. My face doesn't look so bad now. It's been pretty much reconstructed. I could do more. I'm not willing to do any more. I don't want to volunteer for surgery for vanity at this point. I've been through enough. And and when I look in the mirror, I get to know I was kissed by God. And uh, I choose to look at it like that. But at the time... See, what gave me value before I had to wreck, I thought, was that I made a little more money than a lot of people. I've always been able to start businesses. I'm just kind of lucky that way. And uh, and I, uh, it's the keeping them going, huh, Beth? <laughs> now, I, I've never had one fail. I just get bored. Um, <laughs> I, I lost my business. I went on food stamps. I became eligible for Social Security disability, and, and I was got eligible for Medicare, and uh, I lost every material thing that I owned, and I always thought that that was part of my value, how I looked, I made some money, and how many people in here think they're smarter than most people in life? (laughs) I did. I lost my ability to read. I had a traumatic brain injury. That's why it was a big deal to read that book, and see, I would read this part of a page, and by the time I got to this page, I could read good. I just couldn't remember any of it, you know? which is the same as losing your ability to read. I practiced a whole year in a little tiny book, and I read it. I went on vacation two weeks. Who goes on vacation to read? I did. I went on vacation for two weeks, and every day, as long as I was awake, I read. And I read, and I read, and I read, and I got to read again. You know why? Because you guys encouraged me. You didn't give up on me. And see, you would think I have no value anymore. I got no meaning in my life. I'm a woman who's ugly. Kids are afraid of me. All right? I'm a woman that has no brain. I can't read. I can't comprehend. I can't do anything new. I'm on the system now. I'm nothing. I'm broke again, right? I didn't feel sorry for myself. I didn't think that. You know why? You guys brought me newcomers. You guys came and gave me a sense of value. You let me be a part of something. When you brought me a newcomer, here's what you bring me. You bring me these young girls. (laughs) I love you guys. And, uh... (laughs) These young girls, they would come to my house and they'd say, now tell Cindy your big problem you told us in the car on the way here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's what would happen. <laughs> Little young whoever, Joni, or we'll call her Joni tonight. Little young Joni would say, wah, wah. <laughs> Cindy, my boyfriend left. Life has lost its meaning. I'd start to say something. I'd have a seizure. (laughs) She would instantly feel better. (laughs) 
see, God uses me where I am. You bring me these new girls that gain a little weight. Tell Cindy how you feel about yourself. Wah, wah. Cindy, I've gained 10 pounds and I don't feel very good about how I look anymore since I got sober. I think if I went back to smoking cigarettes, I could lose the weight and feel better. I'd say, oh, honey. I understand exactly what it feels like to not feel good about how you look. And do you know what would happen? She would instantly feel better about her life. And the truth is, here's what happens. See, see, the most that I ever get to be is an instrument of God. The most I ever get to accomplish is to get to touch you somehow. I'm not in charge of how that happens. And so the truth is, the fact that it happened through seizures and having a broken face still gave me a sense of value. Because you know why you guys wanted to bring me your newcomers? I could help them heal in ways you had no power. <laughs> And see, I didn't understand that it was really my brokenness that was helping them. I just knew everybody wants to come see me. And you know what? It made me feel better. And you guys told me, keep trying. And you helped me walk. And you helped me participate. And you know what happened? I started to get my life back. Nobody would hire me. So I got a straight commission sales job selling technology, which was brand new. And I had a brain injury. couldn't remember anything. <laughs> But, you know, don't let what you don't know stand in your way. No. And you know what happened? I became the best technology person, salesperson in, the, in our little region. And we got this little new company that, uh, because it was the ISP era and it was people were funding, you know, it was magic money for dot coms. And I became the, 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 the director of sales and marketing for the largest uh, the largest Internet company in my little region. And, uh, and uh, two weeks later, I was diagnosed with cancer. I was kind of disappointing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And uh, at first I had this great attitude because I just, I just pushed hell uphill, you know? And so it's like, this will be all right. I had breast cancer. I was only 36. I was 34 when I had the wreck. I was 36 when I had cancer. And uh, because of my age, they had some concerns about it because uh, it's very early to have breast cancer. And then it turns out, well, it was in my lymph nodes. And that's a real kind of bummer. Got two little kinds of breast cancer and got some little lymph node involvement. And now they're talking to me about what the next year is going to look like and how I'm going to be bald and all the chemo I'm going to go through and what's going to happen at the end of that and what radiation is going to look like. And, uh, and then I got a day that I got pissed. And I, I, and I really have a pretty good attitude, right? But I got mad. And I kicked the back screen door off my house. And I had a chat with God. And I said, God, what do you want from me? I had a childhood that should have killed anybody. I came out of institutions where people are left to rot. I came off the streets that nobody makes it off of alive. All right, I have alcoholism and drug addiction and I'm recovering. All right, I had a highway motorcycle accident that should have killed anybody. And now I got cancer? What do you want from me? I paused, like it says in 11th step, pause when agitator down there. <laughs> The brain injury took a lot of my pause button away, I'm here to tell you. So that was nothing but a miracle. But, um, but I paused, and I don't know about you, but God talks back to me. And what I heard was, Cindy, you had a childhood that should have killed anybody. You grew up in institutions where most people are left to rot. You came off the streets that nobody makes it off of. You're recovering from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. You survived a motorcycle accident that nobody should have survived. You have cancer, and you are alive at 36 with the wisdom of all of that. Mm. And so in a moment's notice, what happened was I went from feeling sorry for myself to feeling how lucky am I. See, how lucky am I? Because I did. At 36 years old, I had the wisdom of an old woman. Because you know what it takes? It takes experience to have wisdom. Experience learned from. Not the kind of experience I have drinking, but experience learned from. And so I had so much wisdom, and in that moment, it was like, okay, all right, God. 
And it was hard. I'm not going to tell you that it was easy. It was hard. Cancer was hard to get through. Chemo and radiation for a year. You know, I, they, they, they took the big boys out with me, and it was a hard little year. Beth went through that with me. You know, the girls would come down from Cincinnati. I lived in Louisville, and they'd clean my house, and people babysat me, and people took care of me, and, you know, thank God. And some people ran away from me. See, everybody came to me with the wreck because there was only one way up. But when I had cancer, people were afraid I was going to die. And I had friends that came to me and said, I'm afraid you're going to die. And I don't think I can handle it. So I'm going to walk away for a while. And you know what I was able to do? I was able to say, okay, that's where you are. I was able to let you be where you are. I was able to tell you that it's going to be okay whether I live or die. I was able to tell you that I love you. I was able to still not have to have it be all about me. See, I got to not live like an active drunk. How lucky am I? How lucky am I? So I got through that. And uh, I started a little business at the end of that. Uh, I started a little web design company. And um, when I started the web design company, it's funny because I was a recipient of the Traumatic Brain Injury Trust Fund. They're trying to help me figure out how to organize my bills because they're spread out all over my, my living room and my dining room floor. I was trying to come up with a system to remember to pay them. And so every night I'd spend hours over my floors trying to make sure I didn't miss a bill. And so they sent people in to help. At the same time, I'm telling them, you know, I'm going to start a business. <laughs> You know what those people said? Okay. See, nobody said you can't. Nobody said don't. <sighs> How lucky am I? You know, and I've sponsored people through this whole deal. And I've had a sponsor. And, uh, and I've participated in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've gone to meetings. And I haven't used my life as a reason not to participate in what breathed life into me. Because Alcoholics Anonymous is responsible for the fact that I get to breathe. And I believe that with all of my heart. I like to tell you that was it. See, when I was 34, I had a little wreck. And when I was 36, I had cancer. And when I was 38, I would start to walk down the road and I would fall down. And sometimes I couldn't get up. And uh, Beth went through that with me too. It's nice when you have history with people. Especially when you're me and you need to prove things. <laughs> But I would fall down, and um, it turned out that what happened was I had a childhood spinal fracture that never got healed or recognized, and then the accident exacerbated that fracture. And so I had a thing called spondylolisthesis. Those of you that are no medicine will know what I'm talking about. And it was uh, it was three quarters. My spine was three quarters off, and uh, my, stretched my spinal cord to a place that that would make me be unable to get up. So they had to go in and cut part of my spinal canal, put rods and plates in my lower back. I had to be on a little walker. And uh, all that's not the great big deal. The great big deal is that when I was in the hospital, um, I had what I like to refer to as the slideshow start up again. And for those of you that come from traumatic histories, you'll know what I'm talking about. Every time that, see, when they open up your central nervous system, it hurts a lot. And... Um, and, and every time I get those shooting neuropathic pains coming through, uh, the pictures of things that happened, the trauma to my back when I was a kid would happen, and it wouldn't stop. Being kicked through doorways, you know, things happening to my back. And it just wouldn't stop. It wouldn't turn off. I couldn't make it go away. And that's hell. That's hell living on earth, you know. And I'm living in a hell. And, 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 and I talked to Beth, and I, and I was on a few, few, little bit of medication, cause when they cut your spinal canal, they do that. And, uh, and, and I was nuts. And, and, I mean, I was just absolutely nuts. And, and, and Beth, Beth, we deal with it. When I got out of there, and I, I did a fifth step, I drove to North Carolina, fifth step with Beth. Beth was my sponsor for about eight years. So, that's, that's, that's part of our history. And, and so, um, and so I did a fifth step, and what came out of that is, um, is is that see my dad I was 17 years sober and um my dad had kicked me through doorways and done things like that and I'd landed in all these institutions and you know I used to blame him a lot and see the amends that I made the amends that I made that weren't so hard are the ones where I just totally hurt people see it's not too hard for me to go say I really harmed you will you forgive me the hard ones are where mostly you harm me and I got 10 percent and I got to own my part you know, those are hard. And what came out of that is that I had to go make amends to my daddy. I had to forgive him. And I've been trying to forgive him for a long time. This is just becoming willing. It takes what it takes. I can't make an amend before I've forgiven somebody. It's impossible. Because if I do, I'm going to bring more harm. I'm going to bring more harm. So I reached a place of forgiveness with my father. And the evidence of this is this. 
I went to my father in Ohio and I said, Daddy, I need to make an appointment with you. I did what I'm taught about amends. And I said, um, I said, I have harmed you. I harmed him because when people would say nice things about him, I would make sure that they knew what a rotten piece of crap he was. I would make sure that I defamed every piece of him. And, uh, and I said, I've harmed you and I've harmed your reputation and I am sorry and I was wrong. And what else can I do to make this right? Because that's what I was taught. And I said, if there's anything else that I've done to harm you that I'm unaware of, please tell me now. And here's what my daddy did. My dad never remembered nothing he did to me. Ever. My cousins had confronted him about this beating time on a camping trip where he beat me with an extension cord and my back and legs bled. And my daddy said this. He said, Cindy, he said, uh, he repeated my words. He said, I, um, I want you to know that I know you love me. And he said, I want you to know that uh, your cousin told me and reminded me of a time when we were on a camping trip and I beat you with an extension cord. And he said, and I want you to know I'm deeply ashamed and I'm very sorry. And I was wrong. And he said, if there's something else I could do to make this right, I want to. And he said, uh, he said, the magic words I've been waiting my whole life to hear. He said, if there's anything else I've done that you'd like to tell me, now's the time. <laughs> Lock and load. <laughs> Here's how I know that I forgave him. Here's what came out of my mouth. Daddy, that was a long time ago. I have forgiven you. What I'd like to do is move on and have a decent father-daughter relationship as long as we're both living. And I'll tell you what happened. I've never had the slideshow again. I'm a free woman. I had no idea. I had no idea that that would make me free. How lucky am I? I'm a good daughter. I'm a good daughter. That doesn't mean I like hanging out with him. It means I'm a good daughter and I can live with myself and I'm proud of who I am. I was 34 when I had the wreck. I was 36 years old when I had cancer. I was 38 when my lower back thing happened. I'd like to tell you that was it. <laughs> when I was 40, which was two years later, it's this two-year thing, I'm in my attic, and uh, I got a brain injury, so I got a balance problem. And uh, somehow in my attic, I um, lost my balance and slipped through the rafters. And I landed on my neck in a doorway below. And I broke my neck. And my C5 vertebrae split in half. I was paralyzed from the chest down. I could not feed myself. I could not walk. They had to do something called a corpectomy on me. Which you hear about people having a little disc and things removed. Well, they had to remove my vertebrae. And uh, they didn't know if I would ever be able to feed myself or walk again or anything else. They reconstructed my neck artificially. I've got plates and rods and screws and cages and I have an artificial neck. Where does that matter? Why does that have to do with my alcoholism? I became completely defeated again sober. I could not help myself. I couldn't pick myself up. I couldn't fight one more fight. I couldn't say, yes, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. You guys had to. You guys never quit showing up. And what I had to do was learn to trust God in a way that I had never trusted God. And I had to talk with God. And I said, God, it is okay for me to die. And if you want me to live, you have to do it because I don't have anything. See, I couldn't be God's little helper. I just had to go to God like a little baby. Obviously, God wanted me here. I don't think that breaking my neck was some lesson for me. It perhaps might have been one for some people around me. What I do know is that I learned to walk again, and I learned to participate in life, and somehow my business kept going on. I have this hugely successful business. <laughs> I got no idea, because I've gone about God's business. Because I haven't quit sponsoring people, because I haven't quit showing up for AA, because I haven't quit having a sponsor and I haven't quit being a part of the deal, God is taking care of my business. 
And then sometimes I can't go to a meeting when I'm in a hospital. You guys bring them to me. I've started over a lot in recovery, and each time I've gotten to be more. With every loss, with everything that's sad, there's been a million gifts. I'm a wise old woman at 44 years old. In December, I'm going to have 22 years continuous sobriety. I will have been sober half of my life. I participate fully in life. I write an article for a woman's magazine on how to deal with pain, with, pain, with chronic and debilitating pain without narcotics. I, uh, I speak publicly for the Brain Injury Association. I sit on the board of directors of several nonprofits. I own a technology company. Um, I can't do technology, uh, so it proves that God did it, okay? Um, you know, I've, been, I've lost everything sober and been happy, and I've been happy no matter what. And that's because of you, because I didn't drink, because you helped me learn that if I'll put God in AA first in my life, everything else will take care of itself. Thank you for a life worth living. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.